This episode is brought to you by Lightpoint, of which I'm the principal engineer. Lightpoint provides the collision reconstruction community with data and education to facilitate and elevate analyses. Our most popular product is our exemplar vehicle point clouds. If you've ever needed to track down an exemplar, you know it takes hours of searching for the perfect model, awkward conversations with dealers, and usually some cash to grease the wheels. Then back at the office, it takes a couple more hours to stitch and clean the data, and that eats up manpower and adds a lot to the bottom line of your invoice. Save yourself the headache so you can spend more time on what really matters, the analysis. Lightpoint has already measured most vehicles with a top-of-the-line scanner, like his RTC360, so no one in the community has to do it again. The exemplar point cloud is delivered in PTS format, includes the interior, and is fully cleaned and ready to drop into your favorite programs, such as Cloud Compare, 3ds Max, Rhino, Virtual Crash, PC Crash, among others. Head over to lightpointdata.com slash datadriven to check out the database and receive 15% off your first order. That's lightpointdata.com slash datadriven. All right, good day, ladies and gentlemen. We have a two for today, two gurus in heavy vehicle event data recorders, Tim Cheek and uh, Matt DeSogra. And I'm gonna read in their bios real quick, give you a little bit of a flavor about who they are and what they have accomplished, and then we'll get right into it. So Tim Cheek is a vehicle products expert at Delta V, focused on uh, vehicle design, manufacturing, maintenance, and operator issues related to accident analysis and prevention, vehicle fires, and vehicle engineering. Prior to Delta V, Tim spent seven years in product development at commercial vehicle manufacturer, where he investigated accidents of various types, including fires of truck and bus products, and assisted legal counsel in the defense of product litigation. Tim is very active among his peers in professional societies, such as SAE and ASM, holding leadership roles at the local, national, and international level, and receiving numerous awards for his outstanding contributions. He continues to be actively involved in various standards committees, published technical research, and instruct SAE's highly lauded seminar he co-developed called Accessing and Interpreting Heavy Vehicle Event Data Recorders. And he is uh, joined by uh, Matt DeSogra, who, uh, from what I understand, is the student that uh, is becoming the master. And Matt has been an engineer with Delta V since 2013, where he specializes in recovery and analysis of data from uh, damaged EDRs and has authored several related SAE papers. In addition, Matt co-instructs the aforementioned SAE seminar with Tim. Matt is also a member of the SA, uh, SAE, sorry, J2728 Heavy Vehicle Event Data Recorder Subcommittee of the Truck and Bus Council. He received his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from the University of North Carolina and is also a licensed professional engineer. So that should uh, help you understand why we're interviewing these gentlemen today, because they are the elite. They are the teachers of uh, the industry. So thank you guys for uh, taking the time. Making the time is probably the better way to say it to, to join in today. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to start a little bit and talk about the way that I understand Delta V from across the country is you guys are a very high-end reconstruction firm specializing in heavy vehicles and heavy vehicle event data recorders, uh, retrieval of that information and interpretation of that information. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that front, but if not, uh, could you guys outline just real quickly each of your roles there? And, and what you're doing kind of on the day-to-day -day level. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I uh, oversee the group in Delta V that handles basically all things EDR, specialty EDR. So that's, um, that's on-site imaging of vehicles, that's benchtop downloads uh, from modules from vehicles, and then that's all the way through the data recovery of damaged modules. Um, so we kind of handle all facets uh, of that aspect of things. And so we support our own engineers internally with that service. And then we also provide that externally to clients across the country who need that level of depth on their cases. Yeah, and I'd say I was Matt before there was a Matt. And then when Matt came along uh, and he decided he wanted to fly on airplanes a lot, I said, Matt, here you go. So actually what I do day to day now is, is I'm focused on uh, casework where a lot of product liability work from my time with a truck manufacturer, uh, work on various aspects of the, from steering to braking to could be, uh, fires, things like that, uh, still involved in EDR, 
Uh, can't get away from that. Certainly in my day-to-day work, I have to use it. But that's that's what my focus is right now. It's not totally EDR. Yeah, and we were talking about it a little bit before recording, and we'll go into it certainly in more depth, but it seems like something you have to throw your whole self at. And if you're not doing that, then you need somebody like Matt to kind of back you up. I think we all need somebody like Matt and the community that we can lean on a little bit. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking obviously a lot about HV EDRs and the majority of the people who are listening will know what that is. But for those that might be outside the industry listening, the HV is heavy vehicle and the EDR is event data recorder. So I guess let's just first start out with what is a heavy vehicle in this context? How do you categorize that? Yeah, I'd say a heavy vehicle, I guess if you were to classify it, they talk about light duty vehicles are 8,500 pounds and less. So when you look at part 563, that's what they apply to under 8,500 pounds. Uh, heavy vehicles, typically we're looking at the other way they classify it would be you know, classes. So there's class one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're looking typically at class six through class eight when we're talking about heavy vehicles. So six would be medium duty trucks, seven and eight would be getting into heavy duty trucks. Okay. And then the EDR part, event data recorder, uh, that kind of the, the description, the name of it tells us most of that. But Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about what the E is, like the event? How, how how are those modules trying to determine whether or not a quote unquote event occurred? Yeah, it's it's a lot less well defined than the situation is in the passenger vehicle world, where you have something like Part Five Sixty Three that lays a, a foundation for for what those things are, how they're supposed to work, uh, and and nothing like that uh, exists in the heavy vehicle realm. The closest we get is an SAE recommended practice. Uh, J2728, uh, which lays that out, but there's no requirement for manufacturers to abide by that. So it's all voluntary. Uh, and furthermore, every manufacturer is free to implement the recorder as they please. So events can be things like uh, a trigger based on a wheel speed change. They could be things like a trigger based on a fault condition. Uh, they could be a trigger based on, let's say, a forward collision warning if the vehicle has radar. The the field of possibilities is pretty vast when it comes to what is the event in question, since there is no uh, set of regulatory definitions for it. And are these generally set up for accident investigators? In other words, why does Freightliner care about events? Generally, yes. Right. There's not a whole lot of other reasons to put something like a hard break uh, recorder, for example, uh, other than looking for these sorts of things. Uh, although. To be fair, a hard break doesn't necessarily imply some sort of accident has occurred, right? That can be generated with a truck just driving down the road. So there are probably some other uses, but I would say largely it's aimed at our community, despite maybe not saying that on the surface. Yeah, and making it very difficult for us at times to uh, access the data and making the data somewhat volatile. So they're like, here's some data, but we're not going to make it that easy. You guys got to bring your game if you want to get Yeah, or, or maybe not even stand by it. Like, for example, Cummins uh, in their event data reports uh, at the bottom puts a disclaimer that basically says something to the effect of, this is not intended to be used for accident reconstruction. So they've, they've done a blanket coverage of their own uh, company there um, by saying that, although there's been plenty of research and papers published that um, validate that. So it is valid to be used, but right. They, they might, they make it difficult in a lot of ways for us. Yeah. I remember yeah, I think Toyota did that for a while and then you show up at depot and that's the first thing that gets brought to your attention. Yeah. I would add to what Matt said about the, the distinction between light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles with light duty. You have the airbag that triggers, you know, typically the event, everything's tied to that to the airbag and that's where the data is recorded. So it's pretty clean when it comes to passenger cars and event data with the CDR, but then we get to heavy trucks and most heavy trucks don't have an airbag. So where do you start, right? So um, if they don't have an airbag, even if they did have an airbag, how do you really define that collision event? So for a heavy truck, you know, that the crash pulse is going to be much different than it is with a light duty vehicle. So where do you set that, that threshold of sensing and then triggering 
for event data recording. That becomes a challenge, right? So that's why you bring in other types of triggers that Matt talked about, these strategies to try to capture various events. And so with the SAE committee that Matt and I are both on, we looked at various triggers. There's now in Europe, a UNECE that they're looking at event data recorders for all sorts of vehicles. They wanted a one rule fits all for every vehicle from light duty to heavy vehicle. And it took a lot of education within that group to say, look, they're different and you have to approach this differently in terms of triggers and um, maybe even in terms of the event window that you're looking at. So if you're looking at five seconds of pre-trigger data for a car, is that sufficient for a truck? Or even, you know, you look at post-trigger data. Do you, you know, do you have the same requirements for light duty versus heavy duty? Because with a truck, oftentimes when there's an impact, the truck driver has to control that vehicle and will be in control, can be in control, unlike a passenger car that once there's an impact, they're probably not in control of the vehicle. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never even considered that um, because you know I've seen enough reports and done enough work and worked with enough experts like you guys that I've seen that there is that post impact documentation in the EDRs for the most part. Uh, but I never really thought about why. I just always appreciated that it existed, but that's a good point. I mean, you get, a 60,000 pound truck, if that's a reasonable number, that it's rear ending a Camry and the Delta V for the truck might be two miles an hour and the driver is still fully in control afterwards. So it's nice to see. Yeah. And that gets to, you know, when you do have an airbag on a heavy duty truck, where do you set that threshold for deployment? You know, do you want that airbag in the truck driver's face, even for say a five mile per hour Delta V? Right. You know, they've got to control that vehicle or even a 10 mile per hour Delta V potentially, you know, can they be controlling the, the vehicle in a 10 mile per hour Delta V? I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, therefore it presents just a different set of challenges. Yeah, that's really interesting. And do all of these trucks have, well, let's call them heavy vehicles because they're not all trucks. Some of them are buses. Uh, it, I imagine there's a, a big array of, of potential vehicles. Do they all have uh, EDRs at this point? I would say for the most part, yes. When we take kind of the broad um, uh, definition of EDRs, you're going to find them in most of them. Some might have multiple, right? Because there's no standard. Like Tim was talking about everything in the passenger vehicle centers around the airbag control module. So on a heavy truck, you might have a data recorder built into, let's say, the engine control ECU, but you might also have one built into the ABS ECU. So you could have a truck with two, or maybe it doesn't have one in the engine, but it does have one in the ABS or whatever. There's all different combinations of it. So as of now, most everything on the road will have at least one of those spots will have an event data recorder, but sometimes we have multiple. Uh, and that, that brings up a whole other interesting set of, uh, of challenges. That's where I'm like, okay, I don't even know what modules are on this truck. I don't know what modules I should be looking for. Therefore, I just need to know who the right expert is. So I think what we're seeing with heavy trucks is there's a lot of aftermarket devices that you can find on them. So you have ELDs, which stands for electronic logging device. You think of your know, truck drivers have to keep hours of service. And so these ELDs now are doing that automatically. It's a requirement for trucks to have that now. And so it's, it's easy now when you have an ELD that is based on GPS to now add other functions to it, like event data recording, right? So that's where you have OmniTrax and PeopleNet and those various systems that you see out there um, they're a pay for play type system, right? A la carte. So you're not going to have it for every system out there. It depends on what they, uh, are paying for. And then dash cameras, of course, that's unique to trucks for the most part. People have, uh, private dash cameras in their cars, but it's getting more and more common to see dash cameras in a truck. They may be standalone systems 
but then they more and more you see that they're tied into the data bus on the truck and they're pulling in some data from the engine, the data bus, the other systems on the truck to supplement that video that they're capturing. And are those generally installed by the fleet or are they sometimes OEM? Yeah, I'd say mostly by the fleet. Uh, okay. You can get those as an OEM install, but uh, that's a very personal decision for a fleet. And there's so many systems out there that it, it would be really hard for an OEM to be able to install you know, all the various systems out there. And then that brings up another challenge for us is that when, when it does get installed as an aftermarket system now and they're tapping into it, the data bus, what does that do to all this data on the, the super highway of data going across on this truck? Is it going to influence the interchange of data and even collecting the data? We see that where yeah. Yeah. when they have an ELD, we go out to the field and we try to tie into the, um, the OBD port on the truck and you have communication problems and it may be because of this ELD system that they have on the truck and you have to find it, unplug it, and then all of a sudden everything communicates well. It, it's kind of the, it's kind of almost the, one of the strength and the weakness of the, the whole CAN system is that it's open. Any, any system can get on the network and start broadcasting and receiving messages, but it's built on the assumption that everything is gonna play nice. And as we're seeing vehicles with more and more aftermarket and third party systems put on that want to have access to the CAN, we're also seeing systems that aren't necessarily playing nice, not I think by intention, but maybe just by oversight, but it is causing issues on the back end when we're in the investigation phase. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a couple interesting things there. One, you have to have a really firm understanding of the electronic system of the truck, even before you show up, you have to have this big foundation. And then two, you have to understand how it might affect the data. Is there any chance that it is kind of overriding the vehicle's EDR, not overriding it, but overtaking it? So there's some more asynchronicity in the data that is being captured by the uh, OEM modules? Does it kind of poke its head in there and change the timing ever? I think so far we haven't seen that, but it's plausible. And so I, it's something that I think we collectively in the industry have to stay vigilant about. Uh, are we seeing instances where we suspect there's interference somewhere? And if so, can we can we really understand it? Um, and so that way we can maybe eliminate it. Well, and it's speaking about asynchronicity, another difference between heavy trucks and passenger cars is the passenger cars based on the airbag module. Everything's kind of in this, this one repository, right? We're seeing other systems on passenger cars now that have data that, that you can pull in various information, uh, say looking at TechStream or you know some of these other systems out there, the vehicle dynamics controller. But for the most part with passenger cars, everything's coming in, in a, from a single repository, let's say. And it, you know, some, somebody like Rick Ruth might kind of pick apart what I'm saying and I might be overgeneralizing, but I think that for heavy trucks, what we have when you look at an event data recorder, there's not a single module that's primarily recording the event data. You have multiple systems on this truck. So it could be coming from you know, the engine controller. It could be coming from the brake controller. It could be coming from a vehicle controller. It could be coming from transmission. You know, all these various systems can record data. So now when you pull that data out, how do you synchronize that data get together in your analysis? It becomes a challenge. Yeah, that, that brings up a, a good point. Um, that there is every, on heavy trucks, um, the event data recorder functionality is always built into some kind of ECU whose primary job is something else. Right, there is no module that's, this is an EDR. I guess you can kind of say the same thing about an airbag control module, but I would put it in the category of it is a purpose-built EDR. Its first job is controlling the airbags, but it, its job really is also to record. 
on heavy trucks, that's just not the case. They're building them into, like Tim said, ABS modules or transmission modules. And so it it's never the case if everything is really easy to do or perfectly aligned because that's not what its main job is. And then when you guys go to the inspection and you find that the wiring system is jacked and you're not able to just plug into the DLC, then you have to know every module that needs to be pulled so that you can go back and start to implement your specialty, Matt, which is the, the bench top stuff. That, and that's like the moving target, right? Is we, if you're plugged in through the DLC, you might know based on the truck that you're at, what things you need to get. Um, but now suddenly you're not in that position and now you need to know, well, okay, of these 15 different pieces of data I want, which ones come from which ECUs? So which ECUs do I need to get? Because the truck might have 15, 16, something different ECUs on it. You probably don't need all of them, but there's probably some you really do need. And so, yeah, trying to maintain this encyclopedia in your mind of where every piece of information lives on all these individual components is almost impossible, but it that's the push, right? That's where um, I think the, the the line for folks in the reconstruction industry is where it starts to say, is this feasible to know everything I need to know about accident reconstruction and also this information, right? That's that's asking a lot. You know, you need a lot of brain power or memory for that. And I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of people that can that want to do that, can do that. You know what I mean? Um, it's a it's a complicated problem. Yeah, it's nice to have uh, Matt DeSogra on your speed dial, right. 800 Matt DeSogra. Because I'm only doing that, right? I'm not having to remember how to do all the other facets of accident reconstruction. Then, okay, I have a little bit of extra mental space, only a little, but some to to try to remember all this. But even then, right, it, this is all I do and I still find it challenging. So I can appreciate why everyone finds that challenging. Yeah, I was speaking with uh, Anthony Cornetto, uh, proprietor of HVE uh, at this point, not HVEDR, but HVE, the simulation package. And I told him that I was going to be speaking with you guys. And he said, oh, yeah, I got Matt on speed dial. Anytime I have an issue, he's he's the guy I call. Um, and, you know, I was similar to what I was saying with uh, Rick Ruth on our podcast is that, you know, we're super appreciative to have guys like you in the community because it's impossible to keep keep that all straight. So we need people that are willing to share and willing to go down that rabbit hole and learn everything that's necessary so that we can then ping the, the, the specialist and know that we're not missing data. That's really important to figuring out how a crash happened. You know, people are depending on us to put all the pieces together. So, um, we appreciate that. And it's not as simple as the passenger vehicles. You have part 563, you have the Bosch tool. There was a, a notice of proposed rulemaking at one point, right? For heavy trucks? There has been, yeah. Right, yeah. And it's, you know, it comes up from time to time again. I think right now what we will probably see in the next month or so is a notice for proposed rulemaking for automatic emergency braking. So that, you know, it we kind of go back and forth between, say, with the heavy trucks, what we're focusing on. And it, it seems right now um, AEB is the focus and and so i think we'll see that coming down the pike now in canada there was a um i wish john stoner was here to to mention it because um there was the hockey team collision that happened oh, yeah. up in canada i forget where that was but that got a lot of focus and so therefore that brought the attention back to event data recording and the investigation of that crash and so the transport canada they invested uh, into a research project in looking at the feasibility of mandating EDR for heavy trucks. And you know, typically, Transport Canada will kind of align with what the U.S. is doing with NHTSA. But this is an area in which they, I think they are kind of taking a little bit further step. I don't know where they are in the process right now, but we may see that become mandated in Canada. Yeah, that'd be nice. So we're uh, talking about the Bosch tool a little bit and how something like that would be great. And that reminds me of Jeremy Daly, Cinercon, and the FLA. Uh, from what I understood, that got bought out by, I can't remember who it was uh, now. Dearborn. 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 That's right. So Dearborn. is that, I haven't seen any progress. Is that still in the mix or is it kind of sitting by the wayside? No, it's it's still in the mix. And, um, you know, I, I think I can remember, I don't remember how many years ago it was when Jeremy 
raised the idea to me when he had started work on it. And I said, wow, that would be great. You know, sign me up if there can be a, a Bosch like CDR tool for heavy trucks, I'll be the first one to use it. But I did say that the challenges are immense here for heavy trucks versus say the passenger car industry. Um, because of some of the reasons we talked about, I mean, there's, you know, all these different repositories of information. There's not as much standardization going on with trucks. It's sort of the wild, wild west, if you will. Uh, even just trying to get a, a communication device that will allow you to interface with a truck that took some time. Yeah, so it, it took the ATA, uh, American Trucking Association, TMC, which is a, a division within that, the maintenance council, to really get together as an industry and say, we need a common device that will allow us to communicate with trucks. Because, you know, if I've got a Cummins engine and they're requiring their device versus a Detroit diesel, their device, Caterpillar, you name it. This gets expensive. We can't really keep up with all of it. So they came out with this common, you know, uh, standard for a communication device. Well, that helped a lot, but that's just the first step now when you're communicating with the truck. And then the next step is where do you get the data? You know, how, what's the Rosetta stone for translating the data? And so, um, the challenges in trying to pull something like that together were immense. Now, hats off to Jeremy for doing that. And I think the device is good, but uh, you can't stop to your point there. So with the Dearborn group, it's going, and, and they're a good group. They, you know, they actually are a maker of communication devices for heavy trucks, RP1210 device. You can buy the DPA-5, I yep. think, is right. their current generation. That's what that. I was going to say. It's, the DPA-5, yeah. of course. D yep. Yeah. Uh, and one of the, the foundations for the FLA is really the DPA device. And so it's, it's pulling a lot of just general information in first, and then it'll go out and it'll request some of the event data. And it can do that as a standalone, and you can also use it as a pass-through device. So uh, if you want to use it as a path pass through device, it's no different than any other data link that you're using. It's when it becomes a standalone device and you say, okay, can it pull the data from the latest Detroit diesel engine? Right. And I think it, the answer currently is no, it, it, cannot. it cannot. Yeah. Um, we probably need to have some of the the guys from forensic training group speak to that, but right. yeah, you know, they have a chart out there that says what it supports, what it doesn't, uh, in terms of a standalone device. And as as technology has marched on, I think the abilities of the device has remained static. Yeah, they ultimately need to get a team on it that's excited about it and continually working with it and probably partner up with guys like you to just help them understand when changes are coming or have come. And I imagine that you're learning a lot about, uh, about a lot of those changes out in the field when you go to actually download a 2023 truck and you're like, wait a second, what is this? Yeah. Now, you know, having said that, even though it's remained static, it's a good uh, tool to have in your toolkit. There's no doubt about that. Um, to have it be your only tool in your toolkit could be a problem depending on the work you're doing. So for example, if you have a Caterpillar engine that experienced a power interruption, it is the tool that we're going to pull out of our toolkit to yep. try to get that data because you won't be able to get that data with the manufacturer software. Manufacturer software sees a incomplete file and it says, I can't retrieve it. Whereas the FLA will retrieve that incomplete file from the power interruption. Right, right. So it, it has utility for sure. Um, but very much, I think, in the context is for the way we use it as a supplemental tool to OEM software, specifically because the challenge is staying on that, staying as close to the cutting edge as, as you feasibly can. Uh, and and it, to date, really, the only way to do that is with the OEM software.
Yeah, I, I remember a couple of times where I would download with the FLA and use it as a pass through and then find out that I wasn't pinging a couple of modules that I could get with, with the Nexic uh, tool. So something to be aware. And if you have an eye up for it, then great. But if it's not something you're looking out for, then you might walk away without all the data, which is, is a nightmare. And one of the things that it seems you have to do to prep, you know, if I'm going out to download the ACM of a Toyota Camry, it's like, okay, it's a Toyota Camry. I'll look up in the CDR tool and good to go. But if it's a 2020 Freightliner, it's the, the most important thing from what I understand is, well, what, what, what's under the hood? What is the engine? Um, a, is that true? And then B, what are the engines that you have to be aware of and have the appropriate tools for at this point? Um, maybe you can answer the first part of the question. So I'll give a slightly different example, but in the same vein, let's say you get a call and they say, Hey, we have a 2020 Mac. Uh, and so you say, okay, well, okay, it's a Mac. So it'll have a Mac event data recorder on it in the vehicle ECU, which is in the cab. So you say, all right, great. And if you do nothing else and just show up thinking that, and then that'll be what I need. And then, you know, you look under the hood and it happens to be bright red and it's a Cummins engine. So congratulations. You have a second data recorder now, uh, in that Cummins, uh, engine. So then you say, okay, well, what kind of ABS do I have? And it has Bendix ABS. So, Hey, we've got BDR Bendix data recorder. There's an event data recorder, a third one now, uh, in the ABS. Uh, and then you look around the cab and there's a camera in the windshield and a radar on the front bumper. You say, ah, this has wingman. So there's more data in that system and there could be videos in the camera. And there's also a controller for the camera called an SDP, which can also have videos, right? So suddenly what looked at the surface is, okay, I get what I have. I got a 2020 Max straightforward download. You show up and your, your scope of work has ballooned tremendously, right? So what uh, what is the most important thing is a difficult question to answer. And in, in the reality is there's so many facets of what is equipped on a truck that become important. The answer is kind of all of them. And some of those things you can know ahead of time. For example, with the VIN, VINs can decode and tell you what kind of engine are, are in the vehicle. But you can't decode a VIN to tell you if it's got uh, a, a wingman camera on it, right? That's not, that's not data stored in a VIN from a generic VIN decoder. Um, so you can look at possibly getting build sheets, but you know how the, the time scale we work on a lot of times is you don't have, <laughs> you don't have days to obtain data about a truck. You're going out there like the same day. So it, now again, there, there's the pressure on you to, to sort of triage this vehicle sitting in front of you for where are all my sources of data, just to even know a roadmap of how to get there. You know, I, I kind of laugh when I go out and download a passenger car, which I probably download maybe, uh, five to 10 a year at the most, but it's heavy trucks, boy. I might, I might download <laughs> five heavy trucks in a week. Yeah, yeah. And so when I go out and I pull out my CDR equipment, I always just pray, I hope it works. I hope it works. Right. Cause I, I have trouble, but then, you know, with heavy trucks, I do it so often. I usually don't have trouble, but that's because I'm doing it every day. So for most people, it's the other way around. CDRs yep. easy, you know, you hit the button, boom, pulls in the data with heavy trucks. You have to, to what Matt was saying, you have to know what you're searching for. What are you asking the truck to give you back? So do I have the right software? Do I even know what software I need? And that's the big challenge is just getting the data on the heavy truck mm -hmm. and communication problems. I mean, you know, if you, if you want them, start getting into heavy truck downloads because because you'll get them. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, that again, that's where it's really helpful to have Matt on speed dial is to help you troubleshoot some of that. Or really even, you know, that's a lot of what we talk about in the class with SAE is, you know, how do you triage the problems that you're having? How do you triage that question of what data am I looking for? How do I triage communication issues, things like that? And we always tell people in the class, hey, grab a dozen donuts, go to your local truck dealer, walk into the uh, sales department and say, hey, can I have some keys and go out and play with trucks? And, and they're usually happy to do it. And it just takes practice. And, and the thing is, is with passenger cars, I feel like the challenge in EDR 
is really analyzing the data. There's a lot there, you know, with more and more modern vehicles, the data can get pretty complex. And um, what's the acronym that, that Rick Ruth? RTFDL. I RTFDL. I mean, that is the key, right? To going through that and really going back to those classes, it becomes really important. Whereas heavy trucks, I, I don't want to downplay that the, uh, the analysis on heavy trucks, but I'd say there's a difference. You know, heavy trucks, it's hard to get the data, maybe a little bit more straightforward in analyzing the data. Whereas with passenger vehicles, that's flip flop. Yeah, and the DL there in the RTFDL would be uh, data limitations. And yeah, we get a lot of guidance, fortunately, on the CDR side of things. You guys are making my heart rate elevate just listening to the idea of showing up to this truck where you're not going to know exactly what's on there, what you need to be prepared, especially if you're traveling somewhere, you're flying, you have to keep a light kit. You show up and you find out there's a module on there that you didn't expect. And then you have to let the client know, hey, it's going to be a few more K because I got to go back to the office and come back out. So one, I'd love to hear you just talk about that. And then two, what are processes and procedures that you would recommend to recons who are faced with that? What can they do to best prepare for what might be there? Some days half that battle or a large part of that battle probably is, is it me or is it the truck, right? Do I have some software problem? Am I out of date? Do I have a driver issue? Is the reason I can't get what I'm trying to get because I haven't fired up this piece of software in four months? Or do I have a perfectly good working copy of the software? And is there some issue on the truck? Like you said, a wiring issue, a, a fuse is blown to that specific module. There's some firmware problem with that module that no one knows about except the manufacturer, which prevents it from talking to you, right? There's and so you, you're sitting there with, you know, your client staring at you, staring at a laptop yeah. and nothing's working. That's the worst. And you're, and you're trying to figure out, you know, is it, can I blame the truck and say, listen, I got everything right. It's the truck's fault. Or are, are you the idiot, right? Who then has to say, well, yeah, I have to come back and uh, write off all this time because it's my fault. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's sort of a universal feeling. That's the only way to maybe get close to solving that problem is just by doing a lot of downloads. So you're, you're using the software regularly. And that's hard to do when you figure there's whatever, 20 some pieces of different software you need to collectively handle all of heavy truck downloads. What's the likelihood that you're firing up all 20, you know, every two weeks and using them right low. So you're, it's almost a guarantee you're going into downloads being rusty. That's just the nature of heavy truck work. I don't think you can avoid that. What to do about it. Um, is a, is, a, is a whole nother question, right? Um, I don't know, Tim, you got ideas? Well, you know, the thing that's coming to mind to me is that with a heavy truck, you've got uh, all this power sitting there with the batteries, right? So after a big crash, what does the, does the tow truck driver do? Cut those battery cables. So one of the things that, that everybody needs to be prepared for is how do I reestablish power? Um, I'm, you know, as much as I've been doing this, I'm amazed at how uh, forgiving it can be sometimes when you've got a pretty damaged truck and you're able to reestablish power and everything just communicates well. You know, it's, it's kind of surprising sometimes uh, how that'll work out. But then you can, you can go to a truck that, has very little damage at all and you can't communicate with anything right and yeah. it's you know somebody's jacked the wiring back with the you know the the uh deutsch connector or something like that mm -hmm. and you have to start digging things out of the dash and truly really try to understand it and even then sometimes you may never figure out the problem and then you have to start going to direct the module and it you know some of it comes down to how much time do I want to spend troubleshooting versus just going straight to the module? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, knowing some of that helps, having the experience helps, but really this goes back to, again, as, as, as these vehicles have become more and more complex, you know, it used to be when uh, we first started teaching the class that the focus was on the engine module. Right. I got the ECM. 
which meant the module off the engine. Done. And as we've talked about, <laughs> yeah, you're done. That that's really just one component of many, and oftentimes maybe the component now that has less data than some of the other components yeah. on the truck. So, um, you know, it, it. I think it really is underscoring the challenge for us as investigators. Back to our discussion earlier, you know, just how do you keep up with it? Are you ready for it? Are you attending training? Do you have a, a plan in place? And for, for the companies that are larger, you can do that. You, know, you can have a Matt DeSoger in your group that specializes in it, shares the information throughout the company. But if you're you know, a small group or a solo practitioner, the challenge is immense. Yeah, and that's fortunately uh, Matt DeSoger for hire, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, I'll, I'll give up my cell phone number uh, for, for, you know, $20 coupons to everybody. <laughs> well, and it, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's the same way for me. Like I, you know, I can, I can reconstruct a, you know, general motorcycle crash, but you know, if anything, if there are issues that become more of a focus on the motorcycle, I'm not a specialist in motorcycles. That's when I call up Lou Peck or I, you know, I refer Lou Peck to the client is a, is a better way to do it. It, I think it, it, it comes back to that. Uh, it's a volume thing, right? Because say you're, you're sitting in a truck and getting some particular error and that's the first time you've ever seen this error, but that might be an error that we sort of have seen, right? It's infrequent, but we've at least seen it. And then there's some arcane workaround for it. Like take this module and unplug it twice and plug it back in and it'll work, which like sounds stupid and actually is the solution that you'd never really intuit from that. And, and then that's just it, right? If you're not doing a high volume, the challenges are even greater, right? It's not that you can't do it, but you're going to run into scenarios like that where, um, there might be a solution, but it's difficult to know. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're at a company, like Tim said, you at least have that advantage. You maybe have a couple of colleagues you could call up, but I think it, in some ways, you know, we might consider ourselves, uh, competitors in some uh, veins, but also we're, we're all colleagues in this sort of like quest to try to understand all of this heavy truck data. And so fortunately, uh, a lot of people are very willing to share experiences and feedback from the field, uh, and, and war stories. And that's helpful for everyone because that's sometimes how we learn about pro uh, problems or realize that, oh, hey, that thing, three other people have now seen that. And then maybe we figure out how to work around that, right? Um, and if we all just keep the information to ourselves and, and we're all, <laughs> we're done, we're toast. I think that's a huge point that you made there. And I think that it's one of potentially the unique things about our industry. And there's people like you guys, and I try to teach as much as I know, I don't hold anything back. I teach everybody anything they wanna know. And if they wanna be a specialist in that, great. But the uh, willingness to share and help everybody out, no matter, you know, like, I, yeah, somebody asked me the other day, who's your competition? And I was like, I really don't see it that way. I don't see that we have any competition. There's, first of all, more work than anybody can handle. And second of all, I'm willing to help anybody out at any point. Um, so, and I hope that that is ultimately, I hope that that's something that the whole community takes away from this conversation is that there is that willingness to help and you need to have the appropriate contacts and be willing to help if you're on the receiving end of that uh, inquiry. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the practicalities. We mentioned already some of the things that trigger an event hard break. Uh, we have uh, fault codes, like you were saying, Matt. And then we have last stop. And last stop seems like potentially the best one at times, but also the most volatile, given that it's the last stop. So when is that overwritten? And is there any advice we can give to fleet manager or accident investigators to help uh, retain that data? That's a challenge is the, is the last stop data. It's volatile and, um, you know, oftentimes it will get overwritten. So one of the things that's in the SAE, not a standard, a recommended practice, J2728, is actually two stop events. So that hopefully, you know, you have that second to the last stop event. Uh, International adopted that approach. Yes. Um, 
it may not always work the way they intended it to work, but that's, you know, that's the plan was they had two stop events in there. Yeah. So they can drive to a rest stop or back to their facility and then park the truck and hopefully that data still remains. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, not to use the answer, but just for the sake of you, if it's only two last stops, there's, it's still almost, you can't really drive it. The double last stop maybe gets you to that, hey, just get it off the travel lane and move it into the shoulder. It covers you on that one. But yeah. even driving it to a rest stop, he has to come to the off ramp. He stops. He has to come, turn in. He stops. Then he has to back in another stop. So you're 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 already three or four in yeah. the overrides. Think about the garbage packer. You know, it's it's July. It's August. You have a full truck of garbage in the back of that the body of that truck. You can't leave that truck sitting there for very long. Yeah. If you've ever gone to a truck that's been sitting down in Florida in July or for more than, you know, a week or so, I challenge you to crawl under that yeah, truck. The hopper juice. Well, now <laughs> yeah. the, the, as inconvenient as hopper juice dripping on you is, it, now these guys are taking the approach of it's a safety issue because if there are lithium batteries in the hopper, they want to they want to get those hoppers emptied because that's how they're having truck fires now is people have improperly disposed of full lithium batteries and then the, now the truck's out of service because it's been an incident and it sits there and then they come out the next morning and the whole truck's burned down so yeah. they they get very like uh motivated to try to want to get the hopper emptied yeah, yeah. so that's a, it, it's an osha issue right yeah. so yeah, so they cool. need to do it so there there are challenges now if you're going to uh crank that engine up as to how to do it, make sure you do it so that you are not overriding data, mm -hmm. especially when now when you tow a truck, you know, typically they're going to disconnect the drive shaft. So you crank that engine up now. And because the, the speed data is really coming off the tail shaft of the transmission, if you have an automatic transmission, um, that, tail shaft is going to start spinning because you have a viscous clutch. And so now, as far as a truck thinks, it's moving down the road. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you have a manual transmission, somebody cranks the truck up, the, the drive shaft's disconnected. Uh, it You could crank that truck up easily with it in gear if the drive shaft is disconnected. Now it starts spinning, it's seeing speed supposedly, mm -hmm. and you've now overwritten data. I mean, we've, you know, if you've done heavy truck work, you've probably, you know, encountered situations where you've downloaded a truck and you see some event data from a date after the crash, but yet that truck's sitting there on blocks and you know, nobody was driving that truck around the yard. That's probably the reason. And uh, so it, it is a challenge. I can remember going back to the garbage packers, uh, crawling under some trucks down in Florida in the heat dog days of summer, even just a week after the crash. And, and fortunately I was in a shop and I take a creeper and literally just crunching over all the maggots that were flowing out of that thing. And it, <laughs> you know, do you think, I'm a one inch above, you know, this whole floor is covered with maggots on that's, you know, and then you, you go home and tell your kids about how glamorous your job oh, is. Oh yeah. Best, <laughs> best job. Yeah. yeah. My <laughs> kid went to school uh, a couple of days ago for dress up, like what, what you want to be. And he chose forensic engineer. It's like, I'm, I'm not sure you get the, he just sees me crashing motorcycles and thinks that that, and I have a ping pong table in my shop. So that's probably, he doesn't see the rolling over the maggots. Uh, <laughs> how how old is your son? Uh, 10. 10. Okay. Yeah. I, I can remember when my son was, uh, I don't know, he was about three years old. So he's still a toddler. He can speak. And, uh, you know, it, the only thing he knew about my work was when we would have these, you know, th these fun parties, like, you know, a fall bonfire and we'd have marshmallows roasting and hay rides and everything. And one day I'm going to work and uh, in the morning he comes down and he says, Daddy, you going to work? I said, yeah. He goes, you going to roast marshmallows today? I'm like, <laughs> yes. Son. Something like that. <laughs> I've got the yep. coolest job in the yeah. world. Yeah. No, I am going to be creeping over yeah. roasting maggots today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
the other thing that's interesting to me from I'm a, I'm a, I'm a layman. So I hear about fault code setting events and then the associated snapshot data. Is that ever something that can be practically implemented and integrated uh, into the accident reconstruction? Is that data useful in that front? Definitely, definitely yes. Um, with some caveats though, um, in the especially, I think the biggest one would be that now you're really into a system that is wholly not designed for us, right? That's a system designed and implemented for technicians to diagnose and fix trucks first and foremost. And then we're now taking it and trying to kind of shoehorn it into our mold of, well, can we use it for our purposes? And the answer a lot of times is yes, there can be useful data in there, but it's a matter of understanding the limitations of that system and, and knowing how to properly apply it with the relevant, let's say, uncertainties that can come with that sort of data. But yeah, sometimes that can provide key evidence in cases also. Yeah, we talk about in the SAE class some examples of where you can use snapshot data, and, and that's really been the only data that we had after a crash to be able to uh, determine a speed and impact. Um, but the other thing is, think about other situations like, <clears throat> let's say a truck that was having mechanical problems with the engine. They didn't get the truck fully out of the roadway because the engine shut down. Now you're really going to have to go and do a deep dive into some of these fault codes, look and see what was going on, why that truck shut down, when the operator was getting the shutdown message, how many times, you know, did the, did the operator hit the uh, sh engine shutdown override switch on the dash 10 times to try to get down to that next exit where there's a pilot station and they can have a cup of coffee when they call the guy to come look at the truck and maybe it finally shut down on them and they didn't weren't able to get off the roadway. So uh, there's, there's definitely times when uh, fault codes become important for the analysis. The other thing is, you know, we talk about in the class, you know, uh, tire marks. You look at heavy truck tire marks and uh, you've got a solid set of dual tire marks. Did they come from the trailer? Did they come from the tractor? And one of the things you can look at is, for example, ABS fault codes. So it's often overlooked is downloading the trailer. And let's say the, the trailer, you have a wheel speed sensor fault. And because the it was not getting good wheel speed sensor data, now the ABS disabled itself on the trailer and it reverts to non-ABS regular foundation brakes. And so therefore those brakes lock up on the trailer, for example, and you get these solid tire marks. Well, you know, if you had done a calculation, let's say you didn't have event data that told you how fast the truck was going, a little bit older truck, and you did your calculations based on the assumption that those dual tire marks were from the tractor versus the trailer, that's going to make a, a difference in your calculations. Yeah, the, the other area that I think that fault codes are evolving into is not just locally stored fault codes, but a lot of OEMs now are implementing systems where uh, vehicle faults can be uploaded to, to the cloud or to a remote server. So fleets can have access in real time to the health of their trucks, right? They're selling this as an add-on service, but the functionality and capability is there. So that can open the door to even wider fault code analysis where now you might have a sort of time history uh, with GPS coordinates, vehicle speeds, and all sorts of stuff, you know, plotted on a map in a web portal showing where the truck was and these fault codes developing, right? Not stuff that is available through a DLC download, something that you would have access to through the fleet's portal uh, if they have that. But that, that world of fault code analysis is not just a static one either. That's evolving into more and more, you know, cloud-based and remote data. Another example would be stability control. Stability control, uh, collision mitigation systems. You know, these depend upon a lot of things that are in good operating condition. And so, you know, looking to see... Uh, why a system may not have responded the way you expected it to respond is going to come down to where all systems go at the time of the incident. That's one thing. So, you know, did you have a 
uh, a radar fault? Did you have a camera that maybe was out of alignment? Did you have a wheel speed sensor that was, um, you know, not giving correct information? Was was there a pressure modulator valve that that may have had an electrical issue, so therefore it's not cycling the way it's supposed to cycle? All of these things become really important now mm -hmm. in looking at that overall crash. And again, you know, back to you know, it, it's no longer good enough for us to fall back on our traditional reconstruction techniques. We have to be experts in understanding these systems if we're going to do a proper reconstruction in some cases. I, I don't want to say this is important in every case, but um, certainly if you look at a truck rollover, you're going to want to know uh, was the stability control system functioning the way it should have if it had stability control. But that, that can be a tough analysis, right? Um, where you now as the expert are expected to uh, be able to answer questions like, well, if this particular fault is active, then what mode and state would the system have been in and what capability is lost because of that or what capability does it still have, right? You've got an active fault for a, a radar partially blocked on a truck with a collision mitigation system. Well, how does that affect that system? Is it still operable? Is it going to respond? Is it not? And sort of, yeah, now where do you get all the answers to those questions? It can become a rabbit hole. And if the, if the fault code is radar blind, what does that mean? Does that what mean, does they, mean? Were, yeah. they were operating, you know, in uh, the, what are the stretches out in I-10, you know, going through the desert that you don't see any metal for a long time. That may throw a radar blind fault and have nothing to do with the radar not being aligned properly or, um, you know, some kind of problem with the radar. It's yeah. just not seeing anything. It's seeing empty space out there. Yeah, and so do you find that you have to do testing at times to figure out how something like that might affect the overall operation of the truck? Sometimes that's the only way to answer some questions, right? You're not going to find um, like detailed performance explanations in the diagnostic trouble code manuals for these, right? Those are geared towards the technicians, again, who are fixing the trucks, but it's not, it might not give you a comprehensive answer of uh, what's going to happen to the, how is the system going to perform with this code? Um, and so, you know, does the manufacturer know? Yes. Are they going to tell you sometimes maybe not? And so the only way would be to try to perform some representative testing and understand that yourselves. And yeah, we've definitely done that. Boy, this gets into the discussion about ADAS, uh, driver assist systems, and really getting to level four autonomy and in higher levels of autonomy is, are we really ready for it? I mean, is the, our whole infrastructure ready for it? The maintainers, you know, inspecting the truck and, um, I don't know that we have time to really get into all that, but you know, at this point in time, say even just a DOT roadside inspection, roadside inspectors for DOT, they're supposed to look and see if, if the ABS light is, is functional, but really that's the only thing they're looking at. So for a truck with collision mitigation, they are not looking at all the other things on that truck to see if it's functional. And so now you pull into the mix uh, a level four truck. You know, are we ready for that to be able to say all systems are a go? So, you know, there's a reason why we don't have self-driving trucks today, right? <laughs> the technology is there, but maybe as a practical way of getting in on the road, there, there's still a lot of limitations. Yeah, from doing uh, doing a little research in preparation for this conversation, I saw a couple interesting things. The uh, Waymo with their Via, and if you believe their website, they're they're basically there. Uh, but like you said, Tim, there's all sorts of other issues that come along with that. And then uh, was it Detroit Assurance that indicated they have a level two autonomous truck where the driver can kind of just, I mean, still has to pay attention, but can take their hands off the wheel for a bit. Yeah, um, you know, I I was out in Portland not too long ago and got to see. Um, I think they called the truck Marianne, if I remember right, and one of their self-driving trucks was sitting there right in front of 
Daimler's headquarters. And I looked at it on the back of this truck. They had these, but double aught, you know, these big battery cables coming out of these uh, boxes on the back of the truck. And I thought, oh my gosh, is this an electric truck? And no, it wasn't an electric truck. It was just the, uh, I think it was the level four autonomous truck that they were testing. And it is so power hungry, you know, for, for all these systems that are working on the truck, because, you know, now you have to have, um, say for steering, you know, they, they're going to use uh, electric power steering and that, that requires a lot of power. And so um, they, as I looked at that, I thought, well, am I ready for that when I go out and investigate a crash to even know how to be safe around a truck like that when you've got mm -hmm. that much amperage? you know, that could be coming off of that truck. And then you bring in these electric trucks and, um, you know, fortunately we haven't had to deal with one of those yet, but I'm going to start putting into my a plan for training, you know, just safety around some of these vehicles. Yeah. And that, the Tesla truck, from what I understand was delivered three months ago to Pepsi and Frito-Lay. So I suspect that you guys are going to be called out to some of those before long. Right. And then there's all the normal questions that arise that now we basically have no answers for at the moment, right? Yeah. What, what, what data is there? How do you get it? What modules are it on? And, you know, maybe you have a truck that's intact. Maybe you have a truck that's in, you know, 17 pieces. And now you, yeah, that all of those questions will, will be there. Um, and yeah, we have to, we have to figure that out because the, the manufacturers don't have, you know, some published guide that says, Hey, Hey, crash investigators. Here, here's how to make your job easy and all the things you need to get and where we keep all of our data and, and all that. You know. When they sit down with the objectives for designing that truck, the electric truck or the autonomous truck, you know, of course, the first thing they do is say, we want to make sure we have all the event data, you know, accounted for in this truck, right? And then they plan for everything else, right? Um, you know, and I say that kind of jokingly, but as you think about autonomous vehicles, whether it's heavy trucks or passenger cars, who's the driver of the truck, right? The driver of the truck has a story to tell. And if the, if the vehicle is now the driver, there really needs to be, you know, some data that's recorded. And I don't know that we're ready for that. A lot of influencers for that, clearly, uh, government is an influencer from a regulatory standpoint and the administration that we have say here in the U S because that can change every four years, you know, we can go back and forth from say being regulatory heavy to regulatory light. And that's going to be a power, powerful influencer. Uh, industry groups will be a powerful influencer moving forward. So, American Trucking Association, TMC, that's a group that uh, I think will influence the processor. Uh, industry, uh, insurance will influence the process. You think about autonomous vehicles and questions that come up now would be who's liable for the crash? You, know, you have a 80,000 pound truck going 65 miles down the roadway and you have something like 15 million joules of energy to deal with, right? And versus a passenger car, you know, the equivalent is probably 5% of that kinetic energy for, for a 4,000 pound passenger car. So it's, it's a big challenge, right? So when you have the first crash with an autonomous truck, it's going to be newsworthy. Mm -hmm. You know, Tesla crashes have been newsworthy. Just imagine that first crash with a self-driving truck. Now you think about platooning, you know, that, that may end up being something that we see more prevalent before we actually see self-driving trucks as platooning. Uh, there's a lot of drivers for that because for fuel efficiency, things like that. But now you have a platoon of trucks that crash that's going to be newsworthy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, it, you know, for the other thing, for the insurance standpoint, as you think about not only who's liable for the crash, but how do you, how do you assess risk? 
you know, for underwriting, how do you um, put a dollar figure when a fleet now is invested heavily in autonomous vehicles, which, you know, that the, you know, it does have a lot of promise for reducing crashes. There's no doubt about that. But how do you assess that risk? So these are things that it's coming, but a lot of questions that surround it. So I wish I had a crystal ball and I could peer into it and, you know, make a lot of money, you know, putting my money on to the right guess. But right now it's a guess. And when is it coming? Yeah. And every, I mean, over the decades, uh, well, probably a decade or so, seems like anybody who's tried to predict the advent of full autonomy has been very far off. You know, we all kind of predicted it earlier or some of the futurists predicted it earlier, but it's a, it's a more, uh, difficult challenge than, than people were expecting. And one of the things like you're talking about, Tim, just the involvement of the manufacturers, they are putting something on the line there. And, uh, I applaud them for that because their goal is to make driving safer. But as they do that and insert themselves more into the driving task, they are putting themselves out there for product liability cases. So product liability, in my estimation, is going to skyrocket over the next 10, 20 years. And hopefully crashes go down as a result. But they're going to take a lot of flack. People like Tesla have already, you know, publicly announced that they are gearing up for battle because they think it's a fight worth fighting and they're going to continue to try to make the cars safer, but they know there are going to be problems along the way and they're going to fight um, the product liability cases that come their way. But it's it's a tough situation for them. Yeah, I think you're right on that. Um, you know, if, if there is a crash, who who's responsible? Is it the motor carrier? Is it the manufacturer? Um, you know, clearly you can make arguments for uh, one or the other or both. You know, the, the motor carrier has to maintain the vehicle. Back to what we were talking about before. So um, the court system is going to have their hands full with that. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to get back to, like you're talking about the maintenance, and then you guys were talking about the radar systems and how sometimes they might uh, – act like they're checked out, but that's just because potentially they haven't seen any metal for a long time. And the active safety systems are, there seems to be just a tremendous amount of uh, progress there and new machines, new contraptions, new logic, new things we have to look out for, new methods of accessing data, new methods of interpreting data. That seems to have accelerated things quite substantially. And that is when uh, I started to get uh, raise an eyebrow and just be like, this is probably not a good idea for me as somebody dabbling in heavy vehicle event data recorders to go out and perform a download any anymore, just because I might miss some of this data. And that's not, I'm not serving the case if I do that and pretend that I, that I can be you guys. Um, so one of the first start with, with Bendix, like what do they have out there and what, what tools do we need to get some of that data? With the Bendix, there there can be data in the ABS controller. So you have the EC60, you have the EC80. Clearly, you're going to need the Bendix software. You'll need need a data link to be able to read the data off of it. And then within that, there's what we call, or what Bendix calls, BDR data, Bendix data recorder. So um, it was Matt, Matt mentioned earlier, Cummins and, and Bendix, they have a disclaimer for uh, that data for crash reconstruction purposes, but you know that's something that you may want to have for your analysis in a crash. Uh, there's a paper that we have coming out in April through SAE on BDR data, really taking a look at the reliability of that data through some controlled testing that was done, comparing it to instrumented uh, data that we capture, as well as data, other data on the data bus. So that should help in the analysis. Um, but to get that BDR data, you can read the data with the Bendix software, but it doesn't translate the data. So you have to send off to Bendix, ask them to translate the data, and then you get it back. Uh, some other information that you can get out of Bendix systems would be uh, the Safety Direct, which Matt had mentioned, SDP. 
Yep. And Safety Direct is more of a dedicated event data recorder. That's specifically what they designed it for. So it's gathering a lot of really good data. Um, SDP is a component of what Bendix calls their Wingman Fusion system. And so most trucks with Wingman Fusion will have SDP data. And it's something that the fleet can subscribe to, kind of like OnStar, for example, where you can get uh, information in a portal, for example. Another source of data that you can have with the Bendix is the Safety Direct processor, which is more of a dedicated event data recorder, uh, which is part of the Wingman Fusion system. It's a component within that system. And really what Bendix designed that for is uh, to be a subscription-based service where a fleet can subscribe now, get information in near real time for looking at the operation of that truck. And then, um, you know, if there is a crash, for example, or there's some incident out there that they want to take a closer look at through the, uh, the, the web-based portal, it will flag certain type of events. So let's say a driver has a hard brake event or a uh, collision mitigation event or something like that, or, or a crash. You know, they can look at that at, in the portal and try to understand it and perhaps use that for driver training purposes um, or use that in an investigation of a crash. If they are not subscribed to the surface or the, the service, it will actually record data in the processor and then that processor would have to be taken off the truck, sent to Bendix, the data extracted and then sent back to you. But that can record video as well as event data. So it's a, it's a really good source of information for crash investigation purposes. Uh, the other thing is just the, the camera up on the windshield itself for the Wingman Fusion that can store video in it as well. So there's a lot of different uh, sources of information with the Bendix system. Uh, so it sounds like the process for you when you're going out to interrogate this vehicle might depend on what service the fleet has subscribed to. So how do you handle that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if if it's a case where you're working for the fleet, then that's a conversation you need to have about what services are they subscribed to. They may already have some of that information. They may already have a video um, and you might not have to, or they might have no clue that their truck was able to record videos. So um, yeah, in, in cases where you're working for the fleet, that's a, that's a joint effort there um, to make sure that you're comprehensively covering all the sources of data. And in cases where you, it's not your truck, right, um, that uh, that can become more difficult, but you sort of have to do your best to have those open conversations about, okay, well, what what is there uh, to, or what might not be there? Here's a proposal on how we should try to uh, cover all the bases of what data could be there. Just sounds like your guys' process must be ever evolving. And every couple of weeks, you're just like, all right, uh, this just came out. How do we handle this? What kind of preparation can we do before we fly out to the middle of Texas to interrogate this, this truck? It's a lot. Yeah, I tell you, uh, you probably see this too, Lou. The, the benefit of actually teaching is that it forces you to keep up with it. So every time we uh, teach the class twice yearly through SAE, we really are working hard at trying to keep the materials updated. And, you know, the byproduct of that is really keeping us up to date in our daily work as well. Um, so, you know, not only do we enjoy teaching the class, back to your point of, of sharing within our community, uh, we like to get to know people out there that, that come to the classes. And when we show up to an inspection, now there's, you know, not all this posturing when you know somebody. Um, but the other thing is it, it forces us to keep sharp and a lot of people that come to the classes, they can teach the class themselves. So, you know, you feel, I, I remember the first time we taught the class, uh, John Steiner and I, you know, were sitting in front of a room full of 25 people and, you know, we felt like we were talking about physics to 
you know, uh, Einstein and Newton, you know, that those were the people in our class. They, they were the people that were really doing heavy truck crashes. And John and I get up and we say, you know, we're here to talk about just our collective experience, but you guys have a lot of experience and we're expecting to learn from you as well. And, and so that's been a great thing. And, you know, now, uh, 12, 13 years into teaching this class, I still enjoy going to that class teaching and, you know, I'm always learning something new through that. And, you know, we kind of joked earlier about, uh, the key to success is call my cell phone. And to be fair, that's kind of one of the things I like the most is those calls because that's a lot of times where we hear about something for the first time, because, you know, I might not be the first guy at a 2023 Freightliner. Somebody else is probably going to be that very first one. And so when I get the call, Hey, I'm, I'm out of the truck. I might not have the answers, but that's the first time, you know, we're hearing about something new. And so then when I, you know, maybe I get subsequent calls and then, you know, we start to build our understanding of a new system that's out that no one's ever seen before. And the manufacturer just quietly implemented and didn't really tell anybody because it's not something anyone outside of our industry might particularly care about. Um, but it makes a big deal for us uh, that, hey, we, they changed, uh, you know, they changed ECMs and it's completely, completely new now. And I'm like, what? Send me a picture of that. Uh, and, you know, and then we have to figure out what to do. So, you know, yeah, like what, what Tim is saying and, and, and to the, the point earlier, um, it's, a, it's a team sport in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it's perfect for you guys who are out there teaching. And like I, I experienced something similar. You become kind of the point man, the contact person when something weird happens. And it's perfect that you're that contact person because now you're going to go dissemi disseminate that information to everybody twice a year. So then it, it propagates yep. from there. It's, it, uh, it does. It's, kind, yeah. it's really valuable. Some of the, qu the questions that get called into us get turned into slides in the SAE course. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's same thing happens here. Somebody, I was teaching a class in uh, Chicago a couple months back and student in there said, Hey, do you know if zero motorcycles have any data? And I was like, I, I do not, I've, I've never seen any. And then the next day he comes to class and said, I called zero and they told me, yep, bring the motorcycle in and we'll be able to download it. It's got event data on there. It's like, perfect. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And I can spread that info to any, anybody. So it's, uh, it, it definitely takes, like Rick says, it takes a village, Rick Ruth. Yeah. Um, and then, so Wabco, they have the on-guard system in pro in pro view, on-guard being collision mitigation from what I know, and then pro, pro guard being, uh, pro view, I'm sorry, being lane departure. Uh, they have a, can you interrogate all of that with the Wabco tool? What is that called again? Wabco toolbox or something generic? That's right. Toolbox. Yeah. And in, okay. in the case of Wabco, it is, uh, less complex than uh, Bendix by contrast, just as far as accessing the data, basically all of it you can access with the publicly available software that they release. Uh, and there isn't a need to send certain pieces of information or certain ECUs to Wabco for, for download. That's nice. Yeah, one of, one of the things that we talk about is <clears throat> with the Wabco, with the OnGuard system, the data, where is it stored? It's up in the radar sensor, right yes. up on the front bumper. Oh, geez. <laughs> which is a great place to store it when it's the first thing at the crash, right? It, it makes sense because <laughs> that's what's generating the data. So we should just leave exactly. it there. Yeah, it's yeah. logical. <laughs> but yeah, oftentimes that is the very thing that's uh, destroyed, um, which they're the only system that works that way. Um, but that, that continues to be the case. Yeah, so you've you've had a number of those where you've actually had to bring it into your lab and and go to chip level data recovery with those. That's right. Fortunately, there's always, at least most of the time, there there is a method available, uh, even when you have damaged ECUs. And so the radar sensors are common ones that we deal with because, yep, they're destroyed, but there could still be data on on the chips as long as the chips are still there. Uh, and so that's that's how we end up having to go about that. Yeah, you got you got to be young to be doing that stuff because uh, you need the eyes for it. You know, I, I, me, I, I, I got the readers already, so I'm not sure I'm doing ch a chip level anything. Well, I look at yeah, I look at Matt, and he's you know looking through his um, his microscope and soldering like this, and just going down. And I'm like, man, I couldn't even take two wires, big wires, and solder yeah. together very well. And you've you've got this chip with. 48 pins coming off of it and you're just going down it. 
I would love to take all the credit for that skill, but there's something magical about like 40x magnification that makes any task really easy, <laughs> even if it's tiny. But yeah, um, steady it's, hands. It's too, a challenge. Right? Yeah, no coffee on those days <laughs> yeah. for sure. That's uh, forget it. You're like, yeah, you're a surgeon, and your background's mechanical engineering, so I suspect that's not something you predicted in your future. It's not. No, I think we're trained to hit most problems with a hammer. So delicate soldering work under a microscope is definitely not, I think, a typical mechanical uh, engineer activity. But uh, somehow I've, I've managed to figure it out uh, with a whole lot of practice. And I suspect, in, in speaking with a lot of reconstructionists, it's probably something that you didn't, you didn't plan on, but once you started seeing the need for it, and you had a certain passion for it, it just developed from there. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a fun problem. It's another one of those, I think one of the things most people like about this industry is a, a lot of days are not the same. A lot of cases, you're always into something different and that's just an extension of that same philosophy, right? The a damaged DCU is always gonna be a little bit different, a little bit of a different challenge. So um, I, I find the problem interesting, right? Uh, doing that kind of work. and. As time has progressed, vehicles are getting more data, data from more places, and we as investigators are coming to rely on that even more, right? I mean, from, from when was the last time we had a crash with no data from any vehicle, right? It's pretty uncommon at this point. So the techniques have evolved to really rely on the data, which ultimately means that we want it more. Uh, and so in cases before where, you know, We've got a damaged ACM, but it's fine because we can. We, we'll still do it without it. No big deal. We're seeing a shift in the philosophy, and people really they want that data. They even if it's damaged, we want to go through the effort because we really need what's on there or something from a heavy truck. So we see the demand growing for that, um, and I think that's that's kind of just going to continue, right? As we all become more interested uh, or reliant, or maybe sometimes the data is the only way to know, right? If we're investigating the performance of one of these collision mitigation systems, th that's it. The data is what we need to understand that. So, uh, we need to have the techniques available to get that data, no matter what condition the ECU is in. Yeah. I feel like that's where we're heading. We're heading towards more and more sources of electronic data, more reliance on it. And, and like you said, Earlier, Tim, I think you mentioned like you can do a recon without it, but it will never be as good as a recon with it. And that's what I tell my clients is my best recon blind data wise is not as good as your average CDR download. If I get that CDR download, it's it's a lot more information. I'll never be able to tell you what the driver is doing five seconds pre-impact via my science unless you have video of it or something like that. So um, it, it, it's huge. Yeah, don't you, you know, you, you've seen this shift now in reconstruction where it used to be about how fast was that vehicle going at the time of the crash. And that's where we spent the bulk of our effort trying to uh, do the analysis and come up with that answer. Uh, but really, it's shifted now from that question. It's still important, but we get that information uh, pretty quickly and, you know, check it, make sure it's right in the context of everything. But now the focus has shifted to everything leading up to that, right? How would things have been different if something else happened? And so um, it's just a different set of challenges with reconstruction as we've seen. And then technology as a whole, you know, we have seen how it's impacted the industry. We think, oh, well, you know, when event data recorders came into to being, we're going to be out of a job, right? And and really, it just created these specialties that we've been talking about. You have to be a specialist now in event data recording, um, and then and then really just uh, taking that data. How do you use it in the analysis to answer? all of these other questions. Yeah, it's it's so important. And I think it's one of the themes that's kind of come out during all these conversations that, that I'm having now is the importance of the electronic data and the importance of knowing your limitations and where you want to focus your efforts, where you want to dive completely down the rabbit hole and where maybe for instance, I just want to go to your class, get exposed to the technology enough so that I can intelligently direct my client and uh, coach them on what's necessary in this case, and then just leave leave it at that. And I think with me personally, as you guys probably know, 
Um, I've chosen to go fully down the motorcycle rabbit hole, the photogrammetry rabbit hole, and then the rest of the stuff, I need to know enough about it through conversations like this and through courses like yours to just be able to be the quarterback for my client to say, here are all of the things that we're going to need to consider for this case. And I can handle X and Y and Z. It's usually not just Z. It's, it's Z and then double A that <laughs> other experts are going to have to come in to handle. Uh, yeah. That's a great Excel joke for the engineers here. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then like you mentioned, one of the other things that I just wanted to touch on before we kind of go into some tools and then the future is, is the trailer data, which, uh, a lot of people don't even know, know exists. So are, those are, uh, modules that are fortunately not on the very front of the vehicle. So I imagine that that data is very often, uh, intact and can be interrogated with the Bendix and the Wabco tools. Is that how we're getting that data? Yeah, we you know, we talked a little bit in a earlier question about trailer data and really when we were talking about diagnostic trouble codes and where that can can be handy, even just looking at a basic ABS and, and it's often overlooked, uh, downloading the trailer. So Wabco in particular, they have a lot of data in one of their trailer ABS modules for stability control. For example, if you have a you know bulk liquid holler uh, trailer. Uh, it may have one of these stability control modules on the trailer from Wabco. And there is a an abundance of data being stored on that module. It's kind of a unicorn. I've, you know, I've only come across uh, one recently. Um, I was aware of it for many, many years and just had not come across a trailer with one of those systems on it. I think it might be a little bit more popular in Europe than it is over here. But when I did uh, see that, that actually turned out to be the way we got the data for the speed of the truck, because this was a truck that was, it was a tractor trailer that was in front and it got rear-ended by another truck. And so we were able to download the data from the trailer and we captured an event when that trailer got pushed sideways it had a stability event and it captured the speed of the truck. It, there was no data in the tractor on that crash from that collision event. Yeah, that's something that's pretty new to me. I first learned about it from Steve Anderson uh, not too long ago. And I was like, there's, tra there's trailer modules? Okay, just further confirmation that I'm out of my wheelhouse and I should not be involved. <laughs> just <laughs> other than telling my client to hire somebody who knows more about it. And usually it's even more difficult to interface with the trailer than it, than it is to interface with the tractor because yeah. you're going through another separate set of adapters and uh, yeah, it presents its own set of challenges. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what, yeah, that brings me up like to back to the point where you're traveling around trying to do this stuff, which just exacerbates the difficulty because if you have a Toyota Tundra and you can just put all of your tools in the back, you can bring everything and you're probably ready to handle everything. But when you're, you're flying on Delta and you got a Pelican, that's as big as they'll let you bring. Um, what, what is your, what does a complete modern toolkit look like showing up to a truck? That's an interesting question. Mm. Yeah. Um, because I think, you know, that's going to depend, I think on a lot of where your, uh, sort of, uh, ceiling is in terms of capability, right? Because depending on where your ceiling of capability is might dictate you need a, a lot more tools to try to get you to the point where you're done saying, okay, I can diagnose to this point and then I'm going to finally throw in the towel. So like, where do you, do you stop at just a, a data link and maybe a multimeter, make sure I've got good battery voltage? Do you also travel with tools and direct to module cables or simulators in case you have to go uh, direct. Uh, I don't know if anyone traveling with a soldering iron and a microscope doing chip transfers in the field. You'll be the first one. Yeah. <laughs> conceivably yeah. that could be, could be something, um, I, you know, to back up in a, in a broader sense, it, it might be kind of all of our jobs to set expectations of our clients about the way that these downloads can go. That if, if we have a, you know, an attorney who's witnessed a couple of CDR downloads, explaining to them how this is not that, right? And that these can be a lot more complicated, take a lot more time, or some, sometimes might run into issues that we just can't get around and then have to use other methods to get there. Um, and so that's, uh, that might be, uh, rather than being fully prepared for everything, is more so preparing your client for 
the the different outcomes that could that could come from one of these and then maybe there's a little less pressure on you to perform right because then we we know it could get tough yeah i think uh, lou what we see with with when you specialize in heavy truck crashes um you oftentimes get called out to the crash within 24 48 hours of the crash which may be a little bit different than other types of crashes you know with passenger cars and say you know things are that are driven by the the personal lines uh insurance versus commercial lines so um because of that it it does present a a different challenge to the investigators like us you have to be ready you know with boots on the ground right away you have to be equipped so uh when you talk about you know where you're going you know we look at a four hour radius as kind of a rapid response radius um to the point of being able to take your vehicle that's well equipped you have all the equipment you don't really know what you're going to encounter when you get out there so you need to have a a full complement of tools you may be doing a brake exam on a trailer you may be doing a lighting exam you may be you know handling various uh edr issues out there so uh to to try to fly somewhere and have all that equipment you know it i don't think it's practical uh certainly not somebody that wants to be doing this for a long time i mean they good way to develop uh, back problems if, if that's what you want to do. So, um, you know, some people have private aircraft and, and we've done that. We've had private aircraft in the past and did rapid response work. And, you know, it, it, it helps for that. But again, it's just over the long term, it's, it's really, really difficult and it can wear you down. Um, so for that reason, we, we look at a four hour radius. When we fly someplace, typically it's not the 24 to 48 hour you know, response from the crash. It's something that happened a while back and we're able to you know, triage it a little bit and figure out what exactly we're gonna be seeing, what the objective is, and, and we can plan what we bring to the inspection. So uh, the other thing is, that's the great thing about you know, teaching a class and getting to know people. You know, sometimes you know exactly who that investigator is going to be that's going to show up at the inspection. And it may be somebody in Philadelphia area. It may be somebody, you know, out in California, Sacramento or someplace. And and you can say, hey, um, are you going to have this equipment? You know, we need to do a brake exam. We're going to a lot of brake exams on heavy trucks. It's a group effort. So um you know there, there's tag teaming that goes along with that and and that's a great thing so um a lot of times that's how we handle those situations yeah it kind of goes back to the cooperation that we were talking about earlier with the exchange of information i have found the same thing when you show up at a, an inspection and the, there's already some sort of relationship or re mutual respect that you get that cooperation at the inspection and it benefits everybody you know if we're we're just hopefully looking for the truth and to do the best investigation possible so that yeah uh, joint inspection cooperation is, is huge so kind of going from the big toolkit everything that would be necessary to do everything um to the minimalistic toolkit like a sole prop who just wants to be able to do the basic stuff and then bring you guys in or somebody like you when necessary. Uh, it seems like with a Nexic and a couple pieces of software, you might be able to handle a, a decent amount of things. Yeah, I think so. Um, you, know, you see some equipment's more common than others from market share out on the roadway. So you know, if you look at the market share of various truck OEMs, that's a driver of that. So are you more likely to encounter one brand of equipment versus another brand of equipment? That can be a regional thing too. So uh, you may be somebody that um, has a client that particularly likes to use you because they had a good experience in the past. And so uh, knowing what equipment that client runs, whether it's a fleet um, is helpful so that you're ready for that. Um, so. You know, I can't really give a specific answer to that, but you mentioned the FLA. You know, the FLA, maybe that's something, if nothing else, 
put the FLA in your, you know, your tool bag. It may not be something that's going to be, you know, uh, if you want to do a lot of truck work that you're going to rely upon, but you know, that's why it may be a good thing for law enforcement. And Jeremy, I think targeted law enforcement with that device initially, because, you know, something is better than nothing. And so that gave them a tool that in some cases they could hit a button, pull in data, and that was better than nothing. And then now you add it, Hey, if I can get, the common software. Um, now I can add a little bit more capability to it. So, you know, that that might I think be one tool to add to your bag of tricks if you're just getting into trucking. Yeah, you know, when when you talked about that philosophy of like, what can I get away with as a minimalist approach, like a Nexic and some software? I I think we're seeing that as a as a philosophy for some folks in the industry where they say, okay, I obviously want to do heavy truck work, um, but I don't want to be a heavy truck EDR specialist either. Right? I, I don't have the time and uh, the desire to uh, specialize like that. So that's, that seems to be where a lot of folks are kind of drawing that, that line is they'll go out, assuming the truck can key on, they can plug into the DLC, they maintain the software and they'll do the download that way. And then once it gets beyond that, Either direct a module or chip level work, then they're then they're contacting other experts in the industry, uh, other firms who can do that work for them. And there are some people that are real comfortable with that um, and and like that arrangement because then hey, as soon as it gets difficult, it's kind of somebody else's problem. Um, but and, you know, but on on the flip side too, we are we are experts and we like to think of ourselves as experts and fully capable of sort of doing everything. Um, so there's that too. And so where, where, where do you, how far do you get, do you, you know, how much do you want to wrestle with this stuff? It's, it's come up in, in some of my other conversations as well. And then I started thinking, well, what about these poor law enforcement officers who might not have that same luxury to sub out, who knows, you know, a $10,000 download to somebody to have them fly out, or they can't bring on Jeff Mutart to analyze the human factors. Um, they can't bring in Rick Ruth to talk about uh, some sort of anomaly. Maybe they can, maybe they can't, but it just seems like they're very often in a situation where they're being tasked with analyzing the whole case, which nowadays is a huge challenge. In some senses, I think, yes, right? That That's something they're going to, we're all going to feel it and they're going to feel it just as much as us in the private side. But I do think they have a bit of a luxury that we might not have on the civil side of things where... Uh, on the criminal investigations, I think they have a little more uh, discretion about what specific things are relevant to the charges that they're potentially investigating, right? Um, and so from a standpoint of heavy vehicle data, they, there can be some cherry picking there, right? We don't need to go after all of these different things if we can get the specific stuff we need from one easily available event data recorder. So yeah, the truck's got seven EDRs on it, but there's one that we can get for basically free and we got it and it answered our question. Easy. On the civil side, that's almost never the case, right? We're being tasked with getting everything, right? This idea of preservation or trying to do this comprehensive sweep of all data that could be on a truck. So the challenge is very different for us where we, a lot of times maybe don't have discretion because our client is specifically asking us to get everything. Uh, and what does the word everything even mean? It's a whole other discussion. So um, to the point for, for law enforcement, I think that that's kind of the, that's the secret tool in the toolbox is that with the discretion, sometimes there's a, a free way or almost free way uh, or very cheap way to get maybe just enough to do what you need to do. Yeah, that's a good point. They, a lot of the times you talk to the law enforcement officers and they're just looking for gross evidence of some sort of negligence. You know, if, if the guy's going 42 and a 35, that's not going to do it for them. They need to just pin down some methodology for establishing that they're at, you know, say 70 and a 35 or something like that. So right. there, there are, you're, you're right. That's a great point. There's some more subtlety that we're after on the civil side that they uh, fortunately don't have to pursue in every criminal matter. If we see sometimes where where the law enforcement actually works with the fleet, let's say if they, um, you know, the fleet may say, "Look, I, you know, I'd like my expert to be able to come in and inspect the truck," and um, and and there's a discussion going on there where they say, "We we will share the data with you." 
right? So that happens as well. We've had that many cases, um, you know, and sometimes that can be a benefit too, because now you're being able to see the truck before, you know, something moves and, um, you know, they have everything locked down. So there's a, there's a beneficial exchange that goes on there. Um, doesn't happen very frequently, but, um, you know, we see that from time to time. No, that's, that's kind of like one of those great, uh, symbiotic relationships there, right? Where on the civil side, you might get early access to a vehicle that's on hold otherwise. And, and for the LE guys, they get someone whose job it is to deal with all the problems of EDR to hand over a complete download. So they don't have to worry about what tools and software and here it all is. And you can, you can look through it and see if it has the things that you need, right. And sort of benefits everybody there. So yeah, very much is an arrangement that, that uh, happens. You, you were mentioning earlier, Tim, that at the beginning, the, the advent of EDR, just like passenger vehicle EDR, that some of the recons were kind of thinking, well, there goes our job. Let's start focusing on, on what's next. Uh, and then the, vi the video being omnipresent now, um, I think some people are thinking that that's going to solve a lot of their cases. And then the progression of uh, EDR data and becoming more and more advanced and including video like the Bendix systems where you get like what 10 seconds pre 10 seconds post do you think there's a world where event data recorders become so good and so easily interpreted that us pesky recons are sidelined well hopefully there's a world in which we are sidelined because there's no more crashes right that's what we hope for I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime but um no I think if anything, it, it's just going to drive more specialization, right? Um, now you need to be able to understand how these systems are working, just like the collision mitigation. Uh, so it's no longer good enough to just understand uh, how crashes happen. You have to understand how these systems are working. And so, um, yeah, I think that's where the the things are going to, to shift in our industry. It On paper, it seems like more data equals more answers. And in practice, it equals more questions. And you need someone who can provide those answers. And so I think the more data that we find on vehicles, the more modules that are recording information, the more systems that are flying around, just means there's more work for us as the investigators to understand and explain them. because. It's already at a point where we do this and feel behind. So someone who doesn't do it at all isn't going to be able to suddenly pick through it. So you, you mentioned, you know, does the data become, in, I guess, interpretable enough or something? Uh, maybe, but it doesn't seem to be going that way, right? It seems to be, almost be going the opposite direction where it's becoming more fragmented and more difficult to put together. So that's, that's only going to drive the need for, for people with specific expertise in that. Well, Matt, when you think about the SAE class that we teach, um, how much of the time would you say we spend on talking about what we call issues with the data? Right? Oh, yeah. So, um, oh, yeah. you know, it could be up to half the time we're talking about the issues. You know, we introduce what is there, how do you get it? But then the, the second half of the discussion is, can you rely upon the data? Mm -hmm. And... Um, Back to, you know, the designers of these systems, um, you know, is this the first thing they start off with? And do they spend a lot of time testing it out and making sure it's working correctly? Does it sell trucks? It doesn't sell trucks, right? So, you know, are they really going to spend a lot of time really doing the kind of work that we do to understand the data, how it gets created? how reliable it is, you know, probably not. So therefore you get a disclaimer on the data that should not be used for crash reconstruction purposes. Yeah, the the EDR data has kind of done the opposite of what I think a lot of people uh, thought might happen in that now we have this data, it's coming from all sorts of different sources. You have to be in tune with the sources of it. You have to be in tune with, like you were saying, Tim, the anomalies and what's required to interpret it. And now we can perform a more sophisticated analysis. We will know more at the end because of this data, but getting to the end is a monumental effort in a lot of these instances. Take video, for instance. I'm sure you guys are working cases where you get video 
And it's like, all right, we, we know the basics of what happened, but if you actually want to interpret that uh, video evidence to determine speeds and uh, use a scalpel to assess avoidability, well, you, you kind of doubled your bill at that point. So you'll have a better answer, but it's way more work. Yeah, like the, sim the simple cases get much simpler, but the complex cases get far more complex. Yeah, I've heard somebody say that, you know, 90% of what there is to know about the crash, we know pretty quickly, right? And the, the other 10% is really how the check's going to be written. And that's where, you know, all that time and course cost goes into figuring out that other 10%. That reminds me of a quote that I love. It says, uh, you're 95% done. Congratulations. You're halfway there. <laughs> yeah. Half, yeah. Yeah. It does feel like that sometimes. So how can we best adapt and keep up with all this? That 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 seems to be I was gonna ask this question. It's on my handy dandy journalist list here, but I think we've already kind of covered it. Is like where are we heading from here? And it seems pretty obvious. I'll let you guys chime in if you think differently, but it's like more data from different sources. It's going to be result in more complex analyses that is going to require more specialty. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. that's a great summary of it. But also, could there be uh, you know regulation coming down that suddenly shifts that whole direction? Uh, you know, with the stroke of a pen. Yes. Also that. So uh, it's a matter of I guess being nimble, right? Being ready for whatever whatever ends up showing up. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then, you know, with heavy trucks and, and what we've discussed with uh, ELDs and just the various aftermarket systems and, and trying to understand what's out there. And, you know, you, you look at just a challenge for us as reconstructionists to keep up with that. Um, but now look at it from a fleet standpoint, you say, man, you know, all this data coming across and, some of the data is coming to, can be, come across in real time. And you look in at our world and litigation and you say, how can a fleet possibly even keep up with that? I mean, it's, you know, talk about drinking from the fire hydrant. Yeah. And I think there's this expectation sometimes that, uh, that, that they should know everything that's going on at all times. And, um, you know, I'm not going to debate whether that's, you know, the right perspective on it, but you can just appreciate the challenge that's there. And even a fleet that's large to be able to do that is, is an immense challenge uh, because the level of data that's coming across only increases. If you have a thousand power units in your fleet, you just have more data to try to manage. And when you're looking at a a fleet that's operating on pretty thin margins as it is, it's, you know, how do you allocate those dollars that you have? We all, you know, you're a business owner, you have to make decisions about how you allocate your dollars and, um, you know, tough decisions have to be made. Um, and I just, you know, as we look at the, the challenges in the transportation industry, uh, over the next years would right now trucking is what one of the most dominant jobs in America today. What's going to happen with autonomous vehicles coming in? You know, um, that's probably going to impact the trucking industry and transportation more than anything. Uh, is you know, now we look at what are those people going to do? So you know, seismic shifts coming across. So not only from what we talk about event data to uh, talking about um, electric vehicles and the, the autonomy and the technology coming in, just lots of things that are going to be ushered in because of you know, the pace of chain that's, change that's going on. Yeah, and you kind of both mentioned it. Uh, Matt, you mentioned being nimble, and Tim, you mentioned drinking out of the fire hose and keeping up. How do us reconstructionists in general, how do we make sure we're getting some of that fire hose, but not getting our face blown off? Um, whether that be a mixture of, you know, courses, are there, are, is there a group? You know, I know there's a CDR group, there's the INCR group, is there an HVEDR group? Just what do you recommend for other reconstructionists to keep their finger on the pulse and make sure they're not falling behind in something as important as this? 
Yeah, I think it you know depends on the type of work that you're doing, but, but you know we we've, we've talked for the you know this time about really being a specialist and and choosing that, and I think Lee, you you would probably agree with this as you've specialized. It's counterintuitive. You actually have more work now as you become a specialist than when you were a generalist. Would you agree with that? Yeah. When when I kind of had pipe dreams of just taking motorcycle cases probably five or 10 years ago, I thought it was just that. I was like, that's what I'm going to work toward, but it seems unlikely. And now I'm turning down most case calls just be, and they're all motorcycle case calls and I, I, I can't handle all of them. So yeah, I would agree with that. Once you develop that expertise, that specialty, that knowledge, people find you. It's scary though, if you're, you know, you, you were self-employed and, you know, How's the phone going to ring? You know, when the phone rings, I need to take that job. So being part of a larger organization brings a little bit of uh, comfort in that regard. So if you are somebody that's in a larger organization, I would really encourage you to to look at developing a specialty uh, because that's been my experience. And the experience really is Delta V, you know, from its origins, we looked at, hey, we're going to focus on just crash reconstruction as opposed to going out and looking at, you know, some uh, ladder failure or a trip and fall or whatever. And because of that, you know, it, it really enabled Delta V to grow pretty rapidly because we became known for, you know, when that truck crash happens, you can pick up the phone and call Delta V and we know we're going to get a good, you know, consistent product from that. So. Um, that would be my message to people that are uh, maybe starting out in this field is look at how I can specialize. I would totally agree. And when I, yeah, when I hire uh, younger people that is, I, I, I think there's, you need a certain marination period where you're getting exposed to all of the elements of collision reconstruction. But if something starts to blow your hair back, dive headfirst into it. And if you find out that after you do that, it's not what you want, then feel free to change, but you will be rewarded for diving headfirst into something in this industry as, uh, I guess all three of us are a manifestation of, of that concept. Yeah. You, um, of course, Lou, you know, Brian Anders, who started Delta V and, and Brian's not practicing the craft anymore, but when I started working with him back in 2005, he, he really had developed a, a reputation, at least in, in the Southeast region for heavy truck crashes. So it was a good marriage for us, for me to join him and, and take my experience with a truck manufacturer and kind of complement what he was already doing. And so at, at the time he was doing a lot of um, work where, uh, he would have to fly places. So he got his pilot's license. And I can remember real clearly one day, he and I were flying somewhere for a crash. And he goes, you know, Tim, um, you know, the, these event data, these ECMs, I, I really have been relying upon dealers to get this data. And I think we need to develop that expertise ourselves. And that, that was the start of where we are today. It, it grew from that conversation, you know, really just going to dealerships, asking a lot of questions. Um, there were really no classes at the time and um, learning a bunch of things and then um, joining the SAE uh, committee on J2728 and developing a relationship with people on that committee like John Steiner, and then John and I, you know, had a like mind where we said, hey, you know, let's share our knowledge. And that led to us developing the class and going out and teaching. And so, um, you know, it's been a great journey. Um, and I just see that continuing on. Yeah, and that led to so many good things, like you were talking about, the development of the SAE class, which is just a real benefit for the whole industry. I mean, I don't know where we'd be without that class on the HVEDR front. Um, oh, to to Mac Volvo, you know, you guys obviously have that relationship with Mac Volvo, where from what I understand, you're kind of handling the east side of the country and Mechanica and John Steiner are handling the west side of the country. And you're the experts on that 
uh, on the acquisition of that data. And I imagine the subsequent interpretation of that data. So man, it's, it's, it's really cool to hear the origin of that. Just a quick conversation in a private airplane. It sounds like heading out to an inspection and, uh, and look where we are now. Yeah. And people, you know, people have asked me, well, how did you become the Mac Volvo people? And, and that was really just you know, that J2728 committee. John and I were on the committee and um, some people in the industry remember back in the time where you would send the modules off to Mac and, you know, maybe six months later, you, you might get the data back. And, and maybe a few months after that, the modules might get shipped back to you. And it, it just really wasn't working. And um, so they decided they needed to get out of the business of downloading and made the decision that because the, the tool was not really ready for uh, just providing to everybody, they went the direction they did. And, and so we happened to be on that committee with Scott Hinkson that uh, would do those downloads. And Scott said, hey, would you guys be interested in doing this? And that was in 2008. And I thought, you know, uh, probably go for about a year or two and then they'll release the software to everybody. And, you know, here we are, how many years later? 15 years later, and it still hasn't yes. happened. You know, maybe it'll happen next month. I have no idea. But until then, we're going to, you know, do the best job we can for everybody out there and, you know, make sure we can answer the questions. And, I'd say the upshot to all that has been if there's any heavy vehicle event data that is the most well understood, it would be Mac Volvo data because of that yes. reason, right? <laughs> it's it. I mean, when you're able to see that volume of downloads from a single system, you can, re you can see all those edge cases and anomalies and strange things. And then you're like, man, if I could just see this for, for everything, right? If I could see that many downloads for Detroit's and Cummins, we'd really understand yeah. everything. And that kind of drives the whole philosophy behind trying to be open with the knowledge that we have, not, not just hoarding it all into Delta V, but teaching the class, sharing what we know, being accessible so people can share that with us, because that's the closest we get to having that, you know, to having hundreds and hundreds of the same kind of download come through where then you can really feel like I've seen every permutation of, of this type of system. Yeah. I, I, lo I love it. And I mean, I, it relieves a lot of my anxiety knowing that you guys are out there and Mechanica's out there because I know that when I get a, a crash involving a tractor trailer, I don't have to be the one to know everything there. And, uh, that's you. I don't know what I would do if I was, if that was on my shoulders, I don't know what I'd do. I guess I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't eat. I would just be constantly working and trying to learn new things. Uh, right. So I, yeah, I really appreciate it. This has been super fun. Uh, and I, I really appreciate you guys making the time uh, a couple hours. It turns out we might've gone a little bit over what I uh, had advertised going into it, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Is there anything that you wanted to say or cover that we haven't talked about yet? I don't think so. No, I think uh, we covered a lot. Yeah. Comprehensive. Thanks for having us. Yeah. It, really it, enjoyed yeah, it. A whole lot of fun. So where do people find you? If they want to reach out, they have a, a case or they just want to talk shop, how how do they find you guys? Yeah. So uh, Delta V Forensic Engineering, uh, we have a website. And then also there's, uh, if you're specifically interested in heavy vehicle event data, uh, hvedr.com. So you know, that's all things Mac and Volvo you can find there if you, if you get a Mac and Volvo truck. Um, you know, how to find one of the service providers, uh, a little bit about the data, uh, that kind of thing. And then also uh, Detroit Assurance as well. Um, if, if you have a uh, Detroit Assurance a collision mitigation system where you need data, uh, we talk about that on that site and, and we can provide assistance in downloading that data directly from the module if needed. Awesome. Well, that's great. It's good to, to know where to find guys like you. That's uh, for sure. And uh, thanks again for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Luke. you. Hey, everyone. One more thing before you get back to business. And that is my weekly bite-sized email to the point. Would you like to get an email from me every Friday discussing a single tool, paper, method, or update in the community? Past topics have covered Toyota's vehicle control history, including a coverage chart, ADAS, that's Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, Tesla Vehicle Data Reports, 
free video analysis tools, and handheld scanners. If that sounds enjoyable and useful, head to lightpointdata.com slash to the point to get the very next one.